So I am going to move us to our next set of speakers, which is a panel uh, of uh, three of our excellent students. Um, Ashley is the uh, CEO of Three Strands Global Foundation and one of our top EMPA students to uh, note that. Sarah is the second year MPA student and Nick is a master's of science fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science. They're gonna share collectively their insights in applying systems concepts to the complexities of some really difficult issues around human rights and conflict, specifically sex trafficking, the protection of journalists and the conflict in Ukraine. So without, for oh, and we have another stellar moderator in Rebecca Mapetit, who is one of our uh, STML certificate students. So we will get started um, with Ashley's talk. Each one will talk for 10 minutes and then Rebecca will come in and moderate the Q&A for all three. So Ashley, without delay. Thank you so much um, for having me today and for being able to just really highlight how systems thinking really changed the strategic objectives of the nonprofit that I run. So I'll just tell you briefly a little bit um, about who I am and um, and what I do in the world and then talk about systems thinking. And, and Rebecca, I know you and I kind of went back and forth on some questions. So um, if, if, if you have them, great. And if not, I have a couple I can address too. So um, so I'm the CEO, as Laura said, of a nonprofit that combats human trafficking um, called Three Strands Global Foundation. Uh, we've been doing this work for 13 years, um, really focused in on prevention uh, and um, prevention through education, uh, which includes schools and child welfare, juvenile justice, um, families and communities, as well as um, direct services through an employee plus empower program. So it's really empowering survivors um, so that they can thrive um, and be financially stable um, after experiencing the complex trauma that they have um, and being victimized through the crime of human trafficking. So for me, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, one of the things that uh, I really appreciated um, in the system thinking, hang on just a second, but bear with me for a sec. Um, was to be able to, you can see that okay, Laura? Is everything good on the, okay, good. Um, so I think that for, for me, it was really about, um, you know, how do we address this wicked problem, right? How do we make sure that beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're addressing what I know and what those of us in the movement know is um, a, a problem that affects 40 million women, women men and children um, around the globe that 71% of victims are women and children, 29% are men and 25 are, um, are girls and boys. Um, and 100,000 of those, and that is a very small number, are in the United States. Um, it's a $150 billion industry and um, it happens in every zip code around the globe um, in the US. And so when I think, when I was yeah, really thinking about it is um, in my executive MPA program and, and systems thinking class, it was really so fortunate as we were putting our strategic objectives together to really think about how do I apply systems thinking and DSRP um, to this wicked problem? Um, because it's not just a global issue, right? I talked about 40 million um, slaves. It's a, the most that we know in history. Um, and, and the problem here, if you look at this slide, is that in 2020, there were only 579 active federal human trafficking prosecutions. So we've got this complex, wicked problem um, where those who are vulnerable are being exploited time and time again. Um, there have been play, things put in place by the uh, Palermo Protocol from a global perspective by the State Department in the US around sort of focusing on what we know as the four Ps, prevention, protection, prosecution, and partnership. Um, and yet this is exploding and growing. Um, and one of those numbers that I share is that, you know, in, in 2000, we had 421, 421 child sexual abuse material reports. And in last year, 2022, it was 85 million. So again, a wicked problem that we need to solve. Um, and as I said, the State Department has really focused in on this, both the form of commercial sexual exploitation, which we call sex trafficking, as well as labor trafficking. So as I was going through using systems thinking and, and really trying to think about 
you know, what is it that we can do? And, and when I think about this human trafficking cycle and I think about the vulnerability as sort of that entry point, the exploitation and the re-victimization, how do we actually reach during vulnerability? How do we rescue or respond? And then how do we restore, right? How could that, what could that look like? And that's sort of the path that Three Strands Global Foundation was on is this idea of prevention through education and, and employment. But when thinking about the distinctions and thinking about how do we actually um, take the mental model and break it down, this is actually what um, I did was to be able to say, okay, so we know the driving forces of human trafficking, we know that increased immigration, we know supply chain when it comes to labor trafficking, the refugee crisis, we know war-torn regions, all of these things that sort of was this spaghetti, right, as we kind of looked at all these different driving forces um, and abuse, a lack of basic needs, all of this is sort of the problem, right, um, and looked at it from that mental model perspective. And so, but by doing this, it allowed me to say, okay, the role that Three Strands is playing and this wicked problem could be so complex and overwhelming, but let's just zero it in on what is it that mission, from a mission perspective um, and from a vision perspective, our vision being a world free from human trafficking and our mission being very focused on prevention education and prevention through employment, how do we address the gaps um, knowing what's happening in that cycle, right? This cycle that I was referring to before, how do we actually address the, the gaps using systems thinking? And so, um, so this actually, I took how the world, but the UN as well as um, the United States um, really parses this out into prevention, partnerships, prosecution and protection and started to really tease out, you know, using systems thinking, how, how is it that we are going to actually address the gaps? Where is it that we can, and that we've already been addressing it for 13 years, and how can we actually look at it differently? And, and more importantly, um, holistically, so that as we think about the system, how do we truly end it? Like, how can we use systems thinking to truly end it? Um, so you can see that I not only took the scope of prevention, but I also looked at you know, partnerships and legislation. And as I started to do this, I realized um, that it really was the legislative piece was an important piece that we hadn't really strategically elevated um, as you know, we had done some work in bills and legislation, but that we hadn't really taken the time to be strategic in that place. And by doing a lot of this work, it allowed us to say, where should we be having conversations with legislators to move the needle as it relates to prevention and the gaps that we're seeing, especially for our youth um, in those numbers that I shared earlier. Um, so, so looking at that, it was, um, it was really an important component of um, really for me, the education piece, the employment piece. Um, and it also, what it was really good is that we had social workers and care managers who did street outreach and we actually pulled back on some of those um, things that we were doing because we realized we needed to be addressing um, the problem, the wicked problem and the seriousness of it through a different system of prevention that we were working on. So um, we pulled back in some strategic areas and then moved forward in others like uh, the legislative piece. Um, and then this is the other thing that was really helpful for me as I used the multi valiant thinking was, you know, as, as I think about the trafficker, the buyer, the victim, and, and prison time, and this kind of brought back in that idea of legislation too, it was the who, what, where, when, why, right? Um, and really putting, um, you know, this mapping really well, what are the parts and relationships? It's not one dimensional. And so what was the goal of this map was to look at the main players and human trafficking and map the mental model. And I really realized that um, looking at our four Ps, it wasn't addressing the full picture about how um, there, the citizens across the US in particular in the ways that we work um, at Three Strands um, were having a lack of understanding of human trafficking. Um, and so by looking at this, it really allowed me to see um, not only bias, but also 
um, the buyer and and how we were or weren't holding them accountable. Um, and then thinking about the different perspectives helped me realize the, the relationships and the motivations of the individuals as well um, that um, are part and parcel of the crime of human trafficking. So, um, and then as I looked at, I, mean, I know this is a really small piece, but I wanted to make sure to share this, you know, as, as I looked and had this mental you know, the sort of complete map of the systems thinking and pulling everything together, not only the driving forces of human trafficking, the need for a federal fo focus, but also this piece that I just talked about using that multi multivalent thinking. Um, and what were those outcomes that we really desire? Um, it helped us to be at three strands, really strategic and where are we going to go from here and how um, do we, are we really focused? Um, and then the other piece, which is important, which I know Derek was just talking about um, a minute ago, which is building this metacognition and emotional intelligence. Um, and this actually for our direct services program was very um important as it made three strands, you know, using DSRP made three strands global foundation more ethical, right? And in how we actually interact with our survivors in our direct services program, how we have a difference, not only using our trauma-informed um, practices, but also how do we incorporate equity in the conversation? How do we make sure that um, that that voices of survivors are elevated in this space. And as we looked at the system and really dove deep into it, it allowed us to um, flush that piece out. So um, anyway, those are just some of the, the things that I wanted to be able to share. Hopefully I didn't go over in time. Um, and then just lastly, what I thought I would do is um, we built a map um, for ourselves at Three Strands after we went through this entire process of um, our executive team of using systems thinking to, to realign where we were headed. And we broke it down, not just prevention as we know we're focused on, but really awareness and primary and secondary and tertiary, and how do we then um, actually, you know, are able to address this wicked problem using systems thinking and by realigning ourselves um, with the, the prevention pillars. So anyway, and then that's just a, a, a shameless plug for three strands that you can go to the website, you can check out all the things that we've done and how um, this has actually changed a lot of what we do in our, the work that we do. So hopefully that was good. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. And next, we're going to hear from Sarah. Yes, uh, let me get my screen up to share. How does that look? Does that, you guys see my, good? Okay, cool. <laughs> Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Liu, and I'm currently an MPA student. And today, I'll be discussing the paper that my partner and I had written about journalists and journalism protection, and some of the unique insights using VMCL has revealed while investigating this human rights issue. <clears throat> so for context, Freedom of expression is one of the recognized core human rights as enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Article 19 specifically focuses on this. So of course, journalists and journalism related activities rely heavily on the protection of free expression as they are key players in the discovery and distribution of information that then informs our lives and that information eventually comes through our phone screens or you know, however you receive your news. Yet journalists have been threatened, jailed and worse even killed for doing their job. So from 2019 to 2021, UNESCO reported an average of 58 journalists killed. And that number rose to a record number of 87 in 2022. And then in 2021, the Committee to Protect Journalists reported that 293 journalists were detained. And that number rose to 363 just last year in 2022 as reported by Wall Street Journal. So personally, it was concerning to see that these numbers were rising, especially considering the existence of Article 19, the existence of human rights organizations that are fighting and advocating for free expression, and then also considering the significant role journalists have in our everyday lives. So why is society failing to protect journalists? What exactly was causing this situation to worsen and exactly what needed to change? 
And these were honestly really big questions and quite frankly, intimidating to attempt to answer for such a huge international social problem. But it turned out much simpler than I had thought as I sought to answer these questions using the theories and principles of VMCL. So one of the key underlying ideas of VMCL that really helped to shed new light on the issue was viewing the situation as a complex adaptive system or CAS. Uh, so I'd like to think of CAS in terms of the give this to Kevin TikTok social media challenge trend that was popular maybe around two years ago, where you had people in a group that had to pass a bag to the next person on their right until they found a person named Kevin. And CAS emphasizes that any collective network of individuals or organizations is made up of individual agents following simple rules. And then these agents adapt as necessary in response to environmental feedback at the local level. And then the interactions of these agents then produces this macro level behavior. So applying this to the issue of journalist freedom, we similarly have a network of agents made up of their own sub-agents following simple rules, responding to the oppression of journalists through policymaking or advocacy for free expression. And then these agents are then interacting, perhaps maybe in the form of partnerships, for instance, with each other to enhance efforts. But the problem again is that the emergent behavior appears to be ineffective against fighting journalist oppression. So somewhere this link was broken. But CAS allowed me to see this large complex issue of journalism freedom as being run by a system of systems with many different agents that were collectively producing the situation that we see today. Now the Cabrera's research shows that in order to influence or change the emergent behavior of a system, focusing on the underlying simple rules is critical to realign mental models and change system level behavior. So whatever simple rules that were driving the agents within the current system seem to be creating this mismatch of mental models and what it means to protect journalists. And those simple rules are as follows, vision, mission, capacity, and learning, or as known, VMCL. And these four simple rules are designed to align and build onto each other to promote a shared mental model that builds a shared organizational culture to successfully achieve the goals of the group. So most importantly, there's actually an emphasis on having a focused, measurable, and achievable vision and a mission that individuals can easily follow to bring about the vision. So essentially, I applied the VMCL framework on a system of one group of local network of agents to identify and analyze the current simple rules running their systematic organization. And this is essentially the results of that brainstorming process. So, Zooming into the map, because this is a lot, <laughs> there are a couple of things to take away. So it was determined from the research that the current vision that we were looking at follows inspiration from Article 19. And while that does make sense, it's not really a clear statement of the desired future centered specifically around journalists and journalism. And then similarly, there was also no clear identifiable actionable mission because the initial research showed that common words used were related to something like an act of freedom from journalists. But the question was more like, what does that look like? And what does freedom look like? And what does an, exactly an act of freedom look like? And most importantly, how does that actually support the vision? And then a similar lack of a connection was also found between um, mission and capacity, where capacity could really be rebranded as a possible list of tactics journalist advocators have used to control a fire, but it's just ineffective at putting it out. And then lastly, it was determined that there was essentially little to no learning feedback loop occurring in the current system, considering again, that there is a rise of journalist death and detainment. So overall, it, there just seemed to be some muddiness around the four simple rules driving this local system, and it just made it really difficult to see how each simple rule was connected and built onto each other to achieve the, the desired state of the world where journalists are protected. But that said, VMCL also provided the skeleton framework to design new simple rules that could potentially realign organizational culture. In the actual paper, we call it Press for the People in the hopes that this new organizational framework can unify mental models and close that missing link and also better achieve the desired world where journalism is free and protected.
And then we also go more in depth in the paper how we use um, the, the VMCL to check the feasibility. But just here, I'm just going to briefly outline what each of those four simple rules may look like in this new organizational culture. So starting with the vision, this is what a possibly new vision could look like, protect and promote journalist freedom. And as you may notice, we purposely included the word, word journalist to emphasize that the future state of the world would center and be dependent on whether or not journalist freedom was being protected and promoted. And then for mission, this is what a possible mission could look like. Um, within it, we have two action verbs to drive the mission, advocate and monitored, where we viewed advocate as being supported by actions such as maybe initiating dialogue around journalism rights or pushing for new policy. And then monitored was designed with the idea that there would be individuals who could work to consolidate and inform other agents in the system of the important updates occurring in the journalist situation. And then we also said this is an improvement from the old mission because here we define more clearly actions to support the vision with this framework and we were able to better clearly connect how each of the mission builds back into the vision. And so moving on to capacity, this is what a possible capacity system could look like for this new system. And then highlighting those uh, highlighted in red, this entire thing is made up of four main systems, which in turn are also made up of their own systems. But the most important thing to get out of it was to make sure that each capacity system would connect directly back to at least one part of the mission and then help that mission statement achieve the vision. And then lastly, and most importantly, we made sure to incorporate a culture of learning in this new VMCL design, as indicated by these example keywords, um, responsible for facilitating and distributing important information in the organization. So for example, in the mission, the action of monitoring was designed to be a major player in receiving distilling outside feedback to then feed back into our capacity system. And then that capacity system has the training system focused on developing adaptive engagement strategies based on the feedback received into the capacity system. But again, this is by no means a final product of the new VMCL, but the reason I went through it today is to show how VMCL already can help improve and realign the culture of an organization to be better aligned with the desired goal of achieving a world where journalists are free. And so perhaps by continuing to revise the VMCL could actually be the first step to achieving a world where journalists have protection and freedom. So in short, taking this large complex issue through a VMC lens revealed that there is underlying simple rules that were leading to the current emergent situation. And honestly, I would have normally approached this situation as like a complex issue of censorship by individuals with authority, but by examining the issues through VMCL, it showed that the entire issue was really a huge system made up of more systems being driven by different simple rules. And everyone likely had the same desired goal to protect journalists, but there was just a mismatch in expectations and how it should be achieved. And so the findings that we're investigating show the versatility of VMCL to be able to pick apart a seemingly complex phenomenon and then being able to break it down to quite simply an issue of agents following simple rules. Thank you so much for listening. And I will now pass it to Nick to present on their research. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um... Let's see if my presentation shows. Does it? Uh, uh, was it showing? Sorry, somebody speak, please. Some of the moderators. Not yet, Nick. OK. Um, let's try again. How? We see it now. OK. And that, th does it work? We see this, the presentation mode, Nick. So see if you can change uh, yes. your name. Well, how about now? It's zoomed out a bit. See if you can play from beginning. Just one more second. Very sorry. Um... Is it showing? Sorry, Rebecca. Yep, there we go. Perfect. Okay, fantastic. 
Sorry about that. Um, well, I, I'm Nicola Stellini. As Professor Cabrera said, I study uh, at the London School of Economics. And today I'm very honored and pleased to talk to you about my end of the semester project uh, for my class of system leadership at Cornell. And the project is called Giovine Ukraina. As you may know from my accent, I'm Italian and Giovine Ukraina literally means young Ukraine. Um, so it is a reference to the Italian Unification Wars. It has its own logic as a name. Um, an important premise before we get into that, um, I am an apologetically pro-Ukraine. The organization is, and the presentation will be as well. If for some reason you disagree with that, you have my name, you feel free to contact me. I kindly ask you, however, to not ask questions about this, because otherwise the conversation gets on geopolitics, and that's not what we want. So with that said, what is Giovine Ukraina, or GU, to keep it a little bit more English? Uh, it's an organization that's designed to facilitate the volunteering equilibrium between pro-Ukraine operating organizations and Italian university students. And there are four things I would like to unpack here. Facilitate, meaning that Giovine Ukraina works by facilitating others. Volunteering equilibrium, uh, sort of a labor market equilibrium. Some people want to work, some people want to hire them, some people want to volunteer, some people want these volunteers. Um, same logic. The pro-Ukraine operating organizations are really any organization that works for Ukraine or for Ukrainians, being the government of Ukraine, or being a food run in your neighborhood, doesn't matter. And lastly, Italian university students are the target that GU engages for volunteers. And the reason here is quite simple. I'm one of them and I wanted to play to my own strengths. So let's look at the operating model. And I think this is a highly important because while Giovine Ukraina is quite niche, here in the operating model lies a very important intuition of system thinking, which could then be expanded beyond Giovine Ukraina, meaning away from the goal of Ukraine and away from the target of Italian university students. So what is this model? Well, the model starts from an intuition, from my own personal experience. I wanted to go to Ukraine on the ground and I ultimately could not because the health insurance was insanely pricey for a war zone. And yes, I should have seen that coming. But the process was overall extremely hard, almost painful. So you want to volunteer, you want to do something good, but you have to do four Google searches for a single thing. Then you have to write emails, then you have to do this and that. And it's quite painful, I, I thought. Ironically, people might find it easier to spend money and to spend time than to do those other emails. We are covered by emails and those might have been too much. So to look at the graph, kind of conceptualize it as a labor market, right? The word market here is important. And basically, because the easiness acts as a ceiling, we lose a whole bunch of volunteers and there are a whole bunch of dead weight losses. So what is the solution of this volunteer market? Well, for me, the solution was conceptualizing as a system. And here is where system thinking, come, system thinking comes in. So if you conceptualize it as a system, instead of trying to get more volunteers yourself or helping Ukraine better, you want to act on that red line and either eliminate it or put it higher. The solution here uh, was making the process as lazy as possible. What does that mean? It means, unfortunately, there are no cats involved, but um, it means that the volunteer tells Giovine Ukraina, I am of age, these are my areas of expertise. I would like to help fro like necessarily from Kiev or necessarily from Italy or on the border or wherever. I'm, I, I accept this much risk, let's say. And with those information, I'm in contact with the operating organizations. And in light of their demand, 
I then propose to the volunteer three possible solutions. Cannot get easier than that. And that, I argue, increases the red line and therefore the quantity of volunteers. Um, so that is system thinking, how you know, the paradigm shift. Now onto system leadership a little bit more. Sarah talked about you know, vision, mission, capacity learning, those things. So I won't repeat the definitions. But um, what I want to point out here, especially in light of the previous presentation, is that everything is quite aligned because it was designed and it was designed, let's say, backward, right? From the mission to the, uh, from the vision to the mission to the capacity. So it's much clearer than the whole system about journalism and, of course, right? Because this is just design and that's a real thing. But what do we have? Well, we have a clear binary vision that can inspire people, that is a Ukrainian rebirth. We have a mission that is the repeated actions that GU would do, meaning reach the volunteers, reach the operating organizations, recruit them, meaning get them on board, and then connect them, meaning put them together. And here, I, I want to underline that this is the US Army three verb gold standard with the addition of for Ukraine to break the rhythm because that three verb in Italian sounds like it's reminiscent of fascism. So we had, we had to break it a little. And then the capacities of the door are not only built as a system of systems, but are also sharp focused on bringing about the mission. Well, that's all well and good, you might say, but how about culture and learning? Well, culture and learning are not there for two reasons. One is they are extremely hard to, to actually graph, again, as we saw before. Uh, and the other reason is, and I'm 100% guilty here, I did not prioritize them. Like, don't get me wrong, I, I had written down everything in my end of the semester project, but when we actually tried to create Job in Ukraine, I didn't prioritize them. Uh, I thought that the group did not need these things that much. And maybe, maybe, they, maybe it did. Um, bottom line here, I wanted to bring your attention to the fact that I missed maybe to prioritize and operationalize these two things. Because ultimately, um, Jovino Kaina is a good idea, and I would say, I, at least I hope, I would say also a good example on how you can operationalize system thinking to bring about change, but it's also a story of failure. As I hinted, we did try to implement it, but then we stopped because there were other organizations that were doing something very similar. But I think that it's still worth analyzing and reflecting on, his, on a story of failure. And this is what system leadership says, because organizations slash systems can grow out of failures if there are appropriate reflections. Um, so yes, let's start thinking about, uh, about why it failed. Uh, here, I hope Professor Cabrera will forgive me for actually putting down three bullet points, uh, but I wanted to write down the main roadblocks that we encountered and ultimately resulted in ver a very hard time in gaining momentum. And what are these roadblocks? Well, again, bullet points, so you can read them. Um, but the organization was virtual based, was part time, and it was volunteer based. So very hard to get people laser focused on there. That might have been because of the other two bullet points. Namely, I was the only one that was versed in VMCL. And when we talk about culture within system leadership, we always say that we need culture leaders. But maybe before having culture leaders, there are culture leader about the vision or the mission or about whatever. I think it's also important to have culture leaders about the importance of knowing the mission or the vision or whatever, right? So that might have been another important roadblock. And as I said before, I forewent one aspect that is basically the design of a curriculum for the onboarding process, right? So 
I put together a team, I explained to the team what GU was, but it was not standardized. And ultimately, that might have been a factor as well. Here, I listed these three points because I'd really like to hear your opinions on if you only maybe could pick one, which one out of this you should pick. And lastly, uh, I, wanna I wanna finish, I wanna close off with a little, a brighter, if you want, uh, note. That is, system thinking helped massively in this undertaking. If we go back about to the beginning, the problem was with a volunteer market, which as a private, as a single citizen, is I think extremely hard to solve. But if you zoom out and you think about it as a system, well, then the paradigm changes and you can actually do something. We couldn't, maybe. Uh, maybe we will in the future, but I, I, I thought that the, the whole process was very instructive. And so I, uh, I'll brought it to your attention. And with that, thank you for your time. Uh, we have a nice final slide. It took me only two hours to make, and that's it. Uh, Rebecca, I'll give the floor back to you and hopefully stop sharing. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Nick. I know we're gonna bring everybody, everybody back together on the same screen. Um, yeah, it's what an honor to be able to moderate um, questions for such a great panel. I think Sarah beautifully summed up the versatility of VMCL um, and how we can use those structures. And it, I think it was so well applied in just this panel where you've all had such different varied topics. Um, but you made them recognizable to people that understand the structure. And so definitely a great pitch for VMCL and be able to look through some of those different structures. Um, I know, Ashley, that we've got some from different sources for you. I think one thing that really stood out from your presentation was that you didn't see like legislation come out as a factor until you broke apart um, different items. I think that ties into maybe some questions we had about distinctions. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how just like looking at your organization, your focuses and making those distinctions, that process kind of worked for you and any big surprises and aha moments you had? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the, the distinctions I think that was clear was that prevention actually wasn't being named in legislative um, work, right? It was much more focused on the protection component. And um, so it was our job then to, to start to have those conversations with legislators around, we, we, we actually talk about prevention um, very specifically as a focus, but it really was the law enforcement prevention. How do we prevent from a law enforcement perspective? So by teasing that out, um, we were able to see that there was this gap and that we weren't addressing it through language legislatively our kids who were being preyed upon um, and then being able to dive even deeper into where are our children and how can then we address prevention directly right so that was something that came about by really um, mapping everything out and teasing it out yeah definitely Sarah I'd love to hear from you too about um, just like the ability to take your the complexity of this issue and then using structure, map things out. Were there any big surprises for you or um, interesting understandings that came from it? Just uh, one or two? Yeah, I mean, I did kind of mention it earlier in my closing remarks because initially, like before I had applied VNCL, I literally viewed like the journalist situation like, oh my gosh, like there's too many like ages involved, there's too many like politicians involved, governments involved, like so many laws that are involved. So it's like, how do you actually like address such a complex social issue? But with VMCL, I think what helped was to create this new framework, literally like a lens where I could see that all of these are just technically people that are involved in the movement um, <clears throat> to protect journalists. But for some reason, that movement wasn't getting toward the state that we wanted to be at for so many years. And so with VMCL, it just helped to break down exactly like maybe these are the network of people that are working together and these are the network of people that are working together. And then within that, it's like people like us that are like working to promote journalist freedom and then being able to translate it and say, oh, it's like these agents that are leading to the situation we are. And so how do we address the agents and the simple rules that were driving that 
to sort of, you know, readjust and realign and hopefully lead to a new world where journalists are protected. Yeah. Nick, I don't know if you saw in the uh, in the comments, but you've got some support for your as lazy as possible mantra. <laughs> Um, and hearing you talk, actually a question that <laughs> <laughs> a question that came up for me is like vo a volunteering system is something that people have issues with across a multitude of sectors, right? Um, did you think about, have you thought about ways that your like simplification of the process or like really facilitating volunteers could be applied to different areas? Like is the way that you've kind of broken it down? Yeah, actually, um, it was a big part in, in the team uh, as again. I am anapologically pro-Ukraine. Pro I'm almost a single issue voter on that if, if we want to take a political science perspective. Other people in the team immediately said, well, that sounds great, but let's make it bigger, right? Let's engage every possible demographic in Italy and beyond, and, and let's open it up. And I say 100%, we should do it as soon as we hit the ground running, and we hit our first mission moments, we, heard, we hit our first successes. The reason why this is so, again, niche is because I always want to first build something and then expand it in every project I do. But I think on principle, the same logic, the same, you know, making it lazy, right? Uh, I, I, I saw the comment. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it could apply to, to any other volunteer market and there are other anecdotal evidence. Um, I, my, my best friend ultimate wanted to volunteer in Africa. He had ultimately after a couple of months of searching, had to go to Athens to teach English to African volunteers. So he, uh, sorry, to, sorry, to African refugees. So he kind of got there, but it took so much effort. So, I think that there is a lot of room to improve here. I'm no expert of the global volunteering system, uh, but I, I think, yes, it, it could be expanded and it's something that people immediately thought about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a great question that came up. And I think every single person who has learned VMCL um, attempted to attack an issue, um, looking at it structurally, has faced this, and then present that to another audience who has a range of maybe familiarity with VMCL and breaking things down. Um, but all of you had a lot of complexity behind your visuals. We were able to see glimpses of it sometimes, but then you usually had to also synthesize it for us. So with that process, can you talk a little bit about that process that you went through in order to show us what we saw today? Um, and also how you were able to move to kind of synthesize your thoughts as well about it, because you can start mapping and making distinctions and you could go on and on. Um, so yeah, we'd love to hear a little bit about the process from each of you. Can we start with you, Ashley? Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate this question because Three Strands has been, you know, in this fight against human trafficking for 13 years. So our vision and our mission, right, we, we've been doing all of this work. And so um, I, even as I was preparing for this and reflecting back on my course project, um, I think that what was really important um, at the time and continues to be in the work that we do is um, to to not be overwhelmed with the wicked problem, but to truly think about where is the vision and the mission of where we're headed um, and, um, and are we missing things? So as I was putting the slides together for this in particular, I wanted to highlight um, addressing the gaps because that's what came about in the course project and by using and applying the systems thinking was that there were a lot of gaps even within the focus of prevention, right? So really kind of taking away the complexity of the problem itself because there are so many things that we could have to, um, worked on but specifically around the vision and the mission of three strands, what is it we're trying to address and who are the agents and what are those components? How do we make sure um, that as we work through the gaps, then the next component was, you know, are we actually um, ethically addressing this as well through prevention too? So, um, and not only that, but when you incorporate that question alone, you start to think about the juvenile justice side and sort of the, the consequences, right? Because that also comes and, and that is another piece of prevention too, that as I was putting this together, I wanted to make sure 
that I highlighted that this is not just about making, you know, ending human trafficking for victims. It's also ending it from a trafficker's perspective and a buyer and everyone in between. Um, and that came through the, the course project, but also in putting this back together and thinking about how I would share that with you, um, you all too, so. Thank you, that's such a great point too. Oh, you do have to, you have to expand it out into all that complexity and then reformat and try and bring back to people, especially with those who aren't familiar. Um, yeah, it's great guidance too, for sure. Sarah, can we hear from you about going from- Yeah, and also I apologize, like suddenly there's a beeping noise behind me, but I don't know if you guys can hear that. Um, okay, so yeah, to basically answer that question. So when I was exploring this topic, um, on it, like I'm not an expert in it. It was more of my interest because I was really interested in understanding more about like how we can use media to sort of press for more information that was very important to get back to the public. And so, and then through that research, I just realized like how much is involved, like how many moving parts are in, involved with journalism and press freedom. And honestly, um, as many have echoed, like this is like a very complex problem and to somehow be able to simplify it was actually one of the challenges that I was working on while putting together the presentation. Um, but I think it's just for me, when I started with the process, it was really just diving into it and seeing what are the salient like takeaways that I personally got, you know, um, and then figuring that out in terms of, you know, what story that I wanted to tell, uh, figuring out where I wanted to pull it out and then sort of matching those points with the visuals I was taking on as well. Um, and the difficult part was that because, again, it was just so much parts moving around, I had to figure out which portion I wanted to zoom in more, which portion I wanted to zoom out. And um, eventually it just, you know, it's eventually I was able to pick the ones that I felt like I knew a little bit more about, felt more comfortable with. And then understanding that and taking that visualization of how each vision, mission, and cultural learning aspect built, was built in. And also reminding myself, everything is a simple role and there's agents. I think that was really key in determining, you know, how I am approaching this journalist situation and how I am presenting it to you guys today. Thanks so much. Nick, we'll pass it on to you. And I see that you have another question too. So if you want to loop the two together or go right into it, then go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I will there then answer this one very briefly. I will say I loved Sarah's presentation, especially, well, the graphs. I think those visualiz visualizations were just fantastic. I was not able to do it with a software, maybe with hand. But um, so no, I, I don't think personally myself, I complain. Um, I had to reduce it to make it a compelling slide. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to add anything here. Uh, should I read the question that uh, the other question that was posed to me? In, Go ahead and uh, summarize wanna... it. So we do have a question is talking um, about volunteer tourism and yeah. tourism, which definitely brings into, I and mean, there are a lot of issues with um, different interpretations of volunteering and different ways that it is brought into places. You had a very specific example, obviously, that yours brought up. Um, so if you want to hit on it briefly. Yeah, uh, I think it's a wonderful question, Christina. Um, yeah, um, and, and also to answer to Mavis, um, where in Africa my friend wanted to go, because the distinction is important, 100%. And to, to start from here, at the beginning, he wanted to go to Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia, because those are regions where Italians have historical responsibilities. We committed atrocities there. And so he said, well, of all places, I would like to go there to play my little part and, and making that right, quote unquote, um, at least do, do a little. But then, then the problem is because of volunteer tourism, it, was, it is incredibly difficult to actually do it in a meaningful way. I helped them in, in this search process and there were opportunities in which you could actually go volunteer in Ethiopia if you pay the a hefty fine and actually you're doing volunteer tourism and you didn't want to do that. So at that point, the, the priority was not the geographical area, but it became doing actual volunteer work. Um, and going back to the actual question, how do you consider uh, volunteer tourism as a factor uh, going back to simplifying things? And here I think 
the um, the spirit is is more important than we actually what the, the what we sketched for for the Ukrainian case. And the spirit is we want to make things as easy as lazy as possible for the volunteers, right? We would offer uh, ideally uh, a counseling for those people that want to get a visa to, to, to a given country. Hypothetically, we could make it easier also talking directly with the legislators on the ground. Um, we didn't think about this in particular, but the, the, the first things that come to my mind are this. So in any, in any way that we can engage the other stakeholders, the other agents, and, and make the process easier and lazier for the people that actually want to go so that they just go. That's that's the idea. Thank you. And so again, thank, great, great questions. Thank you. I know that we could stay on all day with more questions for these great panelists. But I see Laura has popped up on screen again, so I'm going to pass it on to her. Great. Thank you. Thank um, each one of you and Rebecca for such a good job moderating. That was a really interesting session about some really um, important topics that I think we need to keep talking about in these open kinds of dialogue.